Welcome to China Tech Talk, the weekly discussion of technology and startups here in China. I am John Artman, editor in chief of Techno.com. As always, joined by Matthew Brennan, founder of China Channel. So this week we talked with、uh, Sam Sachs, a senior fellow in the Technology Policy Program at CSIS, and so she looks a lot at、uh, innovation, cybersecurity, and、uh, ICT policies globally, but specifically. Uh, focusing on China, so we got her、um, on the show to talk about the, the、uh, cybersecurity law. We did indeed.、Um, I've got to give a shout out actually to、uh, the another podcast,、um, China Econ Talk, because that's where I found Sam. Right, so I listened to their podcast, and、uh, I've got to admit, like, oh, this is, this is their best episode. This is great topic, and like Sam knows so much about it. So、um, okay, we、we'll、have to reach out and, and try and get her on our podcast. And, and here she is. We got her. So I'm, I'm really excited to have her on because、um, I think this is a, a you know a hot topic,、uh, something that people really don't understand. I'm struggling to get a hold of it.、Mm-hmm. I, I think you are the same, John. Right? We're all like, you know, what is this actually all about? And、uh, and Sam seems to be like one, like really. Um, deeply into this area, yeah, and definitely, and I, and I think you know、um, the conversation for me reinforced some 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 things that I've been thinking about uh, intuitions um, as well,、um, and I think you know just looking at you know what exactly is the law, what what. What 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 role is it actually playing? Because as you say, like we don't, we're still trying to wrap our minds around it. But at the end of the day, you know, this is it's 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 aspirational. Just because you know we're not we're not dealing with the European Union, we're not dealing with you know the United States, where where once. The legislature passes a law; it it's you know it, it's something that、um, has has very clear consequences. You might say,、uh, you know, this this is China, and so just because there is this law, you know, the the implementation is not going to be clear. And so, being able to talk about that and and、um, explore some of what that means was really interesting. So, without further ado, we give you Sam Sack. Well, Sam, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks so much for having me. So, one of the first questions that we like to ask、um, all of our guests is:、uh, is what's your what's your China story? Tell us about a little bit about who you are and and what's your connection with China. I am a senior fellow at CSIS in the Technology Policy Program, and my research focuses on Chinese. Technology and cyber policy. Before coming to CSIS, I've worked on these issues both from the public and the private sector. Most recently, I was at Siemens, where I launched their cybersecurity business in Asia,、um, and I was at Eurasia Group, leading their China tech sector practice before. And previous to that, I worked with the U.S. government, focused on China's S and T. Um, policies, advising senior officials on what exactly is going on on the space in China. But I've been studying Chinese since I was in high school. Actually, I started studying Chinese because I was failing my Spanish class in in middle school, and I said, <laughs> "Let's switch to a language that doesn't have grammar." So here I am. Yeah, I have a, I have a similar thing. I, I studied、uh, German when I was in middle school, and when I discovered、uh, Chinese in university, it was、uh, it was very refreshing. It works for certain learning styles. You have to be a visual learner, though, for sure. Mm, mm. But so, I guess I mean, so you know, you started learning Chinese in high school, but then, like, what, 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 what kept you going、uh, in terms of Chinese study and, and looking at,、uh, you know, China from a policy perspective? It's a miracle that I kept going because my first trip to China, I was miserable. I was I was in a language immersion program in two thousand one in a hot on a hot summer in Beijing. Um, speaking only Chinese in classes for ten hours a day, and I thought, why am I doing this? But I think it kind of becomes an obsession, and I got the bug and studied Chinese literature and translation in college, and have been going ever since. And then, what about what about technology and like ICT and and, and cybersecurity? What what got you into、uh, into looking at, at at this these areas specifically? You know. I think it was one of these crossing the river by feeling the stones. There was some interesting stuff going on,、um, more on the defense and security side, and I began looking at China's defense industries and kind of how civilian and military sectors were working together. This was about a decade ago,、um, and I just found it to be really interesting. But now I'm working exclusively on the commercial digital economy side because I think that some of the most exciting stuff is happening.
in the private sector in these areas and companies are kind of on the front line as this story unfolds in China. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's plenty of exciting stuff going on. Um, but like today, um, we're going to cover one of uh, a super interesting area, Sam, that you you know quite a lot about, actually. Um, and I'm sure some of our listeners has kind of heard of it. I mean, like, I'm sure everyone's heard of GDPR, so we, we kind of use that as a, as, a, as a touch point of reference here. But um, perhaps some of our listeners uh, haven't even heard about the cybersecurity law um, in China. So perhaps you could give us like a, a layman's introduction of the new legislation and, and you know, provide some, some, some broad high level context of you know, what is cybersecurity law. China's cybersecurity law took effect in June of 2017. And it came out of an environment where the leaders in China recognized that um, the digital economy and technology was moving faster than their, their ability to monitor and control it. And so over the past couple of years, there's been a rapid build out of a whole system of laws and regulations, which really give the government more tools um, from a legal, from a, a state perspective, to control this rapidly growing digital economy, so China's cybersecurity law is the most comprehensive piece of legislation in the world around governing cyberspace. Because under one law, it has rules for online content, for critical infrastructure for data flows, for personal information. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. So I think China is further ahead than all governments in sort of grappling with what is a national approach to governing these new technologies. And it's embodied in the cybersecurity law. I will say though that the cybersecurity law is just the cent it's just one piece, but it's the centerpiece of dozens and dozens of different um, laws, regulations, and standards that all flow from it. And it's best understood as an interlocking matrix rather than sort of a one one law that's the end of the story. Got it. Right. Actually, actually you know, as you were saying that, like something, a really strange question came to my head, like, you know, this term cyber, cyber security, cyberspace, it seems to get used a lot more in China than, you know, like it's kind of, it's to me saying like cyberspace sounds like something from the 1990s. Like, yeah. um, but it's, it's something that gets used quite a lot, like when we talk about China. It I, is, I think the word is actually not even an accurate description of what we're talking about because what we're really talking about is the cybersecurity is one piece of it. But you're also talking about the digital economy, where you're talking about mobile apps and IoT and cloud and, and data flows. And in some ways, cybersecurity is kind of a more narrow way to talk about these much bigger concepts. So that may be an English translation issue. You know, do we talk about network? We talk about network. We talk about internet. The word cyber is a bit of a misnomer. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, just, just a side point, just an interesting one that pops into my head. Yeah. But, okay, so like cybersecurity law, um, you know, what, what, what prompted the formation of these laws? Well, I really, I think it did come out of this recognition by China's leadership that they needed more comprehensive tools to control um, the digital space, whether we call it cyber, um, the internet, what have you. The most important elements of the cybersecurity law I think that the number one is around um, is around data, and the cybersecurity law introduced rules for not only how personal information is collected. It says you have to have consent. It also has rules around how data um, leaves the country. What kinds of data need to undergo an assessment before it can be sent out? So I'd say that's number one. You also have new rules around something called critical information infrastructure. Now, what does that even mean? Well, that's another story. It's very political and still under debate as we speak. But anything that's deemed critical information infrastructure or CII is going to be subject to much more scrutiny by the Chinese government. So these are areas I think are sort of top concern. The other, of course, is how is the kind of information that can be posted online and content controls. So within this one body of legislation, there's so much. I would focus on those three areas. Yeah, it, it's interesting because so so there. I mean, I think that there there's a bit of a. Uh, 
a trope or perhaps a misconception or a narrative um, around the Chinese government. Um, and, you know, I, I think it can be easily um, overstated that the cybersecurity law is kind of about, you know, controlling information, uh, digital sovereignty and things like that. But one of the first things that you mentioned there was about what actually happens with with personal data and, and the need for consent. So there is there is some thinking about data rights, let's say, of, of individual users. Let's back up, though, and talk about what do we mean by data rights in the China context? Because many people would be surprised to even hear that this exists in China. So when we talk about data privacy in the Chinese context, I think we're talking about users' ability to have more control over the way that private companies are handling their information, which is really different from talking about what the government is doing with your information. So in the past year, even since China's cybersecurity law took effect, there have been a number of scandals. I know you guys are following these. You know, just the most recent example was about leakage of personal information um, with a hotel a hotel chain. Um, last year, Ant Financial, the financial affiliate of Alibaba, got in trouble because users found out that their information was automatically being sent to the Sesame Credit scoring system. They had pre-checked a box. So they were automatically opting in without their permission. Um, Once this was disclosed, um, there was a big outcry on social media. The box is now not, it doesn't come pre-checked. Ant Financial set up a data privacy officer. But when we think about all of this stuff, again, the focus is on private companies. I don't think that Chinese users have an outlet to really express the same kinds of concerns around the way that the government is using their data. So I think of that as the background for understanding the context of some of these new rules that are coming out. Absolutely. I think there's like a narrative um, in media and there's an intense debate actually about whether Chinese citizens or netizens like are really actually concerned about privacy or aware about you know, personal data. Um, you know, Robin Lee from Baidu famously said that you know people weren't that concerned and then there was a big outcry. Um, it's a complex issue, you know. Obviously, taking the, the Chinese internet, there's you've got people down in rural areas who are, you know, probably don't have much awareness, I guess, of of uh, of, uh, of these issues. But then you have uh, lots of people who are and are very vocal about it. Um, but it's it's something that uh, certainly there's been a, a lot of debate about this. And you know, what's what's your take, Sam? You know, is there higher? What what is the state of awareness in China about? use of personal data? I'd say in, 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 the, in the urban areas, there is growing awareness of this as an issue. It's focused on things like fraud, on is your information being sold on the black market online, right? The, the sort of famous scandal where this, the, the student found a hospital that was promoted on Baidu and turned out and then got fraudulent, really terrible treatment and died in the hospital. You know, that's, I think, where most of these, this awareness about about privacy and, and fraud online is coming to a fore. Um, I think that there is certainly, but this is all so new. It's still really early. Um, I think everywhere I look, I see informa- I see more, you know, um, mentions of things like data privacy and protection of data. Like this month in Beijing, there's got to be a dozen different events all focused on data protection. I'm going to be speaking at a couple of them. One is at Alibaba. One is, you know, at, with an industry association. So everyone's talking about it, but it's still so early. I don't think people exactly know what it even means and what they mean by it. And there's not any, they're not consensus, you know, just like there's not consensus on it in other parts of the world. But it's it's also interesting just to kind of tease out some some cultural differences as well, because, you know, these like the idea of of rights, uh, the ideas of, of privacy to a certain degree. I mean, these are these are kind of imported ideas um, in, a, in, a, in a certain sense where they're not necessarily, um, quote unquote, native to China, you might say. So, I mean, do you think that that's 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 kind of like this this even defining what a right is, defining what what basic what basic privacy means? Means. I mean, how how big of a how big of a uh, of a factor is that playing? There's so much internal contradiction about this because, and going back to China's cybersecurity law, if we were to try to look to that law to understand what rights over your data mean, 
it's, it's full of contradiction. You couldn't answer it because in one law, you not only have a rule around consent to collect personal information, you also have rules that give the government more tools to invade your privacy. You know, there are more on-site inspections of internet service providers, real name registration, which essentially eliminate your ability to be anonymous online. So how do we make sense of the fact that both of these things are contained in one body of law that undermine each other? How do you have no uh, anonymity online, and then at the same time, you have these vague rules around consent. I've kind of tried to make sense of it. The only answer that I have come up with for myself is you have so many different stakeholders, both within the, the, the government bureaucracy and sort of within industry in China, that, that this contradiction just reflects the government's effort to accommodate all of their you know, requirements in one piece of legislation in a way that actually is somewhat incoherent. So there's no way to make sense of it. Okay. Okay. But like if, um, if we take this and, and apply it to something practical uh, on the ground, so we know that in China, the reality is that, that data is leaked, stolen on a regular basis is from, from businesses, you know, both big and small, and there's a thriving black market uh, for data in China. Uh, and as you mentioned previously, uh, you know, this is illustrated even very, very recently with, um, with Quadru Hotels. You know, their database was hacked and put up for sale uh, online for Bitcoin. Actually, um, almost certainly my information is in that database, <laughs> um, which I'm not very happy about. But like, you know, let's take this very practical situation. Um, this new legislation comes in. Um, how, how, do, how would it affect things? You know, are companies like Huaju, would they, you know, are they required now to have more protection of their own data? Uh, how would this legislation actually affect the, the real situation? Let's talk about what exactly the legislation is. Um, and then some of the questions around how it's going to be implemented and enforced. The cybersecurity law really only has one or two lines. It's very high level. So what happened next is in December of last year, the government issued what's called the Personal Information Security Specification, which is meant to flesh out some of the details around how, how companies can collect your data, um, what consent means, conditions that they can share and transfer, what to do in the event of a breach. Now, this is a specification, which means it's, according to the lead drafter of it, it's just a recommendation for companies. It's not mandatory. It's one interpretation of China's cybersecurity law. Now, the problem, though, is that the way it's going to be enforced is unclear, and you're going to have different stakeholders with very different agendas implementing it. So I've already heard of a number of companies that have been visited by inspectors and audited against this standard to see if they're complying with it. I think it's going to be somewhat ad hoc, though, and uneven, um, as is the case with many laws and regulations in China. Uh, the government has broad discretion. So as Chinese companies that have a lot of user data become powerful and regulators want to have some kind of tool that they can use to crack down on them, again, having data commercially, politically um, carries a lot of value. These rules can be one way, I think, that they can kind of keep companies in check. So it may be less about privacy rights and maybe more about other kinds of agendas that enforcers have, whether you're talking about the local security bureaus um, or the industry sec sector uh, regulators. Yeah, ma makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, but OK, so let's expand. You know, you've been breached. Um, will companies in China expect that they would be fined now for, um, for, for something like this if it was found that they didn't have uh, appropriate firewalls or technology in place to, to prevent hacks? Um, they, they could be under the new specification. But there's a lot of debate even within the government about the specification. I think when it first came out, it was kind of controversial because there was disagreement about how it was meant to be used. Some were even um, not happy with the fact that regulators had begun enforcing the specification before it formally took effect. So um, that's why I think this is all going to be uneven. I mean, technically, if you just look at what's written down in it, yes, companies can be subject to fines for data breach. But as you guys know, this all is sort of up to who has the power as they're going around knocking on doors of these companies. But certainly we could expect, you know, like you referred to earlier with the, 
Alipay and what they did with sort of hiding the, the box for consent um, in, in one of their promotional things. You know, that kind of stuff now is, is uh, you know, it's off limits. Right. right. I, I think that Chinese Internet companies in particular are preparing to comply with it, even if it's considered recommended, because it just creates a vulnerability. Um, and in this environment right now, there's a lot of emphasis on um, you know, officials are under pressure. Are you implementing the cybersecurity law? And companies who are not prepared are going to be, uh, you know, are, are going to be at risk. It's not just China's rules around data that companies are preparing for. They're also looking at Europe's GDPR because Chinese companies that handle EU citizens' data that have um, subsidiaries that they've opened in Europe, a lot of these companies are trying to expand into global markets. Be, um, and be competitive outside of China's closed internet ecosystem, they're worried about GDPR. I've heard that Tencent began preparing to be compliant with GDPR about a year and a half before the rules even took effect. So that's another area to watch. Yeah, certainly. I know from um, European users of WeChat, for example, they receive uh, a lot more um, messages of uh, when, you, when you follow an official account, for example, they would get a... Uh, a pop-up message that users in China would not get. Um, if you have data um, from a European user on your on your servers through a WeChat official account, uh, and then they unfollow it, you, you get a message uh, from Tencent asking you to delete that data. So, yeah, there, ha there has definitely been some effect on the, on the ecosystem from GDPR. The big question around Chinese companies and GDPR is to what extent Will enforcement authorities um, implement these rules outside of Europe? So it's unclear if Chinese companies will even um, you know, fall in scope of that. I think they're certainly preparing for if they will be, but no one quite knows about that extraterritorial extraterritorial enforcement. But on the question on the question of GDPR, it's one of the things that I was the most surprised to learn about. China's data privacy specification is that the drafters of it actually modeled it on GDPR. And for people that think that data privacy just doesn't exist in China, it's really shocking to hear that China's rules actually take a lot of take cues from GDPR, which is the strictest, most comprehensive privacy legislation in the world. So, for example, looking um, at the definition of consent. Now, what the drafters wanted to do, though, is they didn't want to um, take everything from GDPR because Beijing has this mandate to have Chinese companies be global leaders in AI and being competitive and innovative in AI relies on training algorithms on massive data sets. So if you hamstring the ability of companies to process and collect data, that can be a big obstacle from the perspective of AI innovation. So the drafter took things from GDPR, but then tried to create more space for companies. So there are exemptions. Yes, you have to have consent before you collect and use data, um, but there are a number of carve outs. So reasons that companies can use where they are doing that without user consent, for example. Um, another one is that the definition of consent is somewhat different in GDPR. Companies have to have explicit consent, which means users so have to affirmatively check a box. They can't just sort of be automatically opted into something, as we saw happen with the Ant Financial Sesame Credit case. Um, and in the Chinese rules, it allows in some cases when the data is not considered sensitive personal data for companies um, to collect it with implied consent, which can be a silent consent. So there's some sort of Chinese characteristics to the, the, the model that GDPR presented to China. Uh, implied consent, could you give like an example? What, what would that actually be in terms of like a user experience? Um, so going back to the example of, of whether a box is checked or not, sometimes yeah. if, you're, if you're using a service and, and you, know, you may not be actively checking a box to say, yes, I've read the policy, I understand how my data is gonna be used and I agree and now let's go ahead and use the service. Maybe that box is pre-checked, um, and so you're just going forward without that affirmation of understanding how it's going to be used. So it's silent or it's um, it's less proactive. Okay, got it. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, one of the, one of the big questions is, I mean, how, how is this actually affecting uh, business, business on the ground? I mean, so you, you mentioned that, that implementation has been, been pretty slow, but I mean, I mean, how, is this, is this going to cut into, you know, internet, internet businesses? I mean, you know, China has kind of been the wild west of, uh, of the internet in a, in a lot of ways. And so, I mean, will, will, do you think that this will slow down, innovation or, or I mean, what, what do you think the overall impact is going to be? So far, I think it hasn't had a tremendous impact because we haven't seen a lot. We haven't seen the rules enforced in a comprehensive way. Um, I, I think that companies are revisiting their privacy policies. Um, there's definitely an awareness of it, but there's still much companies still have much greater access to user data in China than I'd say companies here in the United States do. So if there's a framework in place that could put a check on companies, but it's all going to depend on how it's enforced. And so far, this is somewhat slow and uneven. So I don't see it having a major impact yet. But let's look at what happens this year because there's so much emphasis on it. Um, there, there have been new rules around um, leakage, damage of personal information um, that came out in draft form around something called the multi-level protection scheme. Two point, uh, I, we call it 2.0, the updated multi-level protection scheme. Um, so it's beginning to crop up in new ways, but it takes some time to trickle down and actually have an effect on companies. I guess that, that is that is the big question. I mean, you know, China is in some ways the land the land of a thousand uh, a thousand regulations, and and the biggest issue, of course, is is always going to be enforcement. Um, I mean, the, so there is so there is definitely pressure from the central government on local authorities, on provincial authorities, to uh, to really start implementing this. I think that. I think that there is, but the problem is it's not a law or a regulation. So there's been some conversations around China having a new personal information protection law, which would have that kind of binding authority, um, similar to the cybersecurity law. I think that's going to move pretty slow, um, but let's keep an eye on that because that could be a real game changer in terms of the effect these rules are having. And uh, we can... So- I think just to make it clear uh, to, to the listeners, right? I think there's, a, I think you've alluded to it already, uh, Sam. But like, there is a big difference here in China. Uh, I, I think that we've we've kind of busted the myth that like there's no there's no concept of, of privacy of data uh, in China. But like, there is a very big divide in terms of how um, rules and regulations affect government's ability to do things compared to private companies. Right, and we've seen even since China's cybersecurity law took effect. I think more intrusive audits where the government goes in and will fine a company for not collecting enough personal information on their users. Rules around denying internet service if you don't use real name registration, right? So um, there are there are a lot of tools that the government has at its disposal to um, to access personal data, and I I don't see any uh, as much concern around that in the same way we have around companies and their sort of misappropriation of user data. So this dual track is is interesting. It's also a compelling model for other countries, you know, because it says, look, you can have a thriving digital economy. Um, at the same time, you can have one of the most sophisticated surveillance censorship systems in the world. And so for countries that are looking to new models for what to do with the internet um, and AI and um, you know, have have their own sort of versions. China presents a great model. That's, I guess, that's kind of the scary part of all this because you know, I mean, so the, most of the cybersecurity laws is focusing literally on on private companies and what they're what they're doing with data. It doesn't say much about the government. No, in fact, I think that the cybersecurity law enhances the government's ability mm-hmm. to do what it wants in this area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things that's always kind of struck me um, is you know. What 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 happens with with our data? I mean, obviously, we're talking a little bit about kind of how how companies use it, but you know, uh, WeChat, for example, they um, they claim that all of their uh, all the all user data is encrypted um, server side, uh, and it kind of raises two questions in my mind. I mean, number one, of course, you know who who owns those keys, um, and the second one is you know what about you know basic end to end encryption? You know what's what's kind of become standard for um, applications and websites and, and services uh, around the world is just something that's not 
not standard in China somehow. I mean, not it, HTTPS isn't even standard on the Chinese internet. Right. I mean, I think that, and for for um, for companies, American companies like Apple, for instance, and you know others, where encryption is is such an important part of their their business model here in the U.S., they make it very clear that in China they have to comply with Chinese law. And that's, you know, and I think that's an attempt to be transparent to users to say, hey, you know, I'd be, you know, let's let's be upfront about um, what is required of, of Apple to be in this market. And, you know, and ex- expectations around encryption may not be the same here as they are in other parts of the world. Um, I, I think that we're going to see more and more of that. You know, the the sort of days of the completely open, free Internet, um, that's that's a bit naive at this point. We're seeing governments around the world take different approaches and um, companies have to comply with those laws to be in to be in those markets. And it's very controversial. I think we saw that controversy come up around Google um, with the news that Google could be coming back to China with a censored search engine. So, you know, what is the what does it mean for you know American companies to be in these in these markets where there are rules that are very different from in the United States? And are there incremental benefits to Chinese users to being there, even if it means that there's a trade off in terms of privacy and what happens with that data? You know, that's a really important conversation. It's an ethical conversation that needs to happen. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, we can look at this on a high level and saying. Now, the Internet started off basically in California, right, as like where it really took off. And, and a lot of the ideas and concepts that we've had about the Internet have, have kind of come from that culture, like as you refer to openness. Um, uh, but we, we've kind of for a long time sort of taken online to be separate from offline, right? As in like what happens, uh, the Internet's kind of a sector in itself and, um, and, it, and it's kind of different from the rest of the economy. But what we're seeing now is the Internet is kind of like infiltrating all industries and, and data is is becoming essential to you know eventually all industries and, and and so we can't you know the concept that they can that the internet shouldn't be uh, um, governed uh, separately within uh, different countries and regions around the world like all other industries are um, I think we're seeing that shift happen now and this is this legislation is is a is a great example of that shift. Um, and so a lot of the conflicts, like when we're talking about Google, for example, as, as we just were, like this is coming from this this, this clash of, of, of ideas here where, um, you know, in one way you could argue, well, you know, China, regardless of how they regulate it, whether you agree with how they treat their Internet, they do have the right to say, like, the Internet is just like any other part of our country and it should, you know, we, we, we control it and regulate it how we want. Um, but that is kind of fundamentally against the sort of like uh, ideas that we had that the internet was uh, was born into and the culture that grew around it. You know, as it was uh, in California, basically, right? So, this I, I think we're going to see a lot more of this sort of like get into grips with this change of like the internet's just way too important now, and um, and com- and countries do need to legislate around it. Um, but it's such a new area that people, you know, we, we, we're really struggling to, to actually work out how to regulate it. And I think we're seeing also like, you know, the, the biggest companies in the world are Internet companies now. And they're just growing and growing and growing. And like, where is this going to lead us? You know, we have trillion dollar Internet companies now. These guys are super powerful. And what, what do governments actually do? You know, where, where is this going to just a trend that's going to keep going and going like are these companies too powerful? There's all these questions. So, um, as, as we're as as governments and companies around the world are grappling with these new questions, I think that China is taking a stand and saying we want to be a leader in shaping these new rules for the internet globally. We don't want to just be a leader in terms of the technologies. We want to seat at the table in the governance around these technologies. And so, if you look at the data protection regime, the burgeoning data protection regime in China. Although it's still new and there's a lot of uncertainty around it, China's put a stake in the ground. So right now you really have, you have a China approach to to governing data, you have a European approach to governing data, um, and places like the U.S. are, are kind of in reactive mode. Um, so, and I think other countries are looking around and saying, oh, well, here's how China's works. Here's how Europe works. Um, and so 
as these rules are in flux, the thing we do know is that China is going to be very influential in shaping this conversation globally. And this is the case in, in areas like AI and, and how data is used in ethics and safety issues around AI as well. They're in the process of writing um, a white paper around standard setting for AI governance. So we have to sort of take this into account, even if we disagree with the China approach to this stuff, it's going to be enormously influential. And companies around the world now are sort of in reactive mode to try to comply with how Europe's doing it, how China's doing it. And now privacy is back on the agenda in the U.S. The U.S. has sort of woken up and gone, wait a second, we need to have some kind of national privacy legislation because the way that we're doing it now has put us sort of at a disadvantage when it comes to what China and Europe are doing. Totally, totally. Uh, and, and we've got areas like India, for example, that are, um, I think this leads into, you know, uh, the, the, the articles I was reading about India was that the, the, the politicians there are complaining about sort of digital colonization, right, that they're, um, which is a separate, uh, kind of a separate area. But I think it does lead into like all of these large questions that we're asking about, you know, how to govern um, the, your internet, how to govern and, and, and data and things like that of your, of your nation. Um, and I completely agree with you. I think China will be a, a, a role model, and uh, there's, there's too much debate focusing on like the the the, uh, the the bad aspects or the perceived bad aspects of censorship and, and, and areas like that. But in many ways, you know, you're, you're right. China is taking a stand, and um, we, I think there's probably going to be a lot of lessons that other countries around the world can take from it. You know, um, not not copy and paste, but adapting uh, things that they're doing here. If China's going to really be a leader in this area and if these new rules are going to have effect, one of the things that the government's going to need to do is they're going to have to sort out who actually is the the in who has authority over data? There's no data protection authority in China. And so this is going to be cause a lot of chaos until they figure that out, because you've got the Ministry of Public Security that has really strong domestic security goals. You have the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is also involved with helping Chinese Internet companies um, be commercially viable and successful. Then you have all these other sort of sector specific authorities. So until they sort out who actually is in charge of data, this is going to be pretty um, uncertain. The other area, you know, going back to this um, issue that John raised about China being the wild west of data, I think that there's this misconception that there's one central repository in the government where all data from every company is pooled and collected, and then sort of algorithmic governance is performed on it, and you know punishments are lotted out based on your social network. And but the problem is that entity doesn't exist yet in the Chinese bureaucracy. So you have everyone has sort of a different piece of this data pie. Companies don't want to share it with each other because that's the crown jewels of their business. I've even heard within Tencent, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, that even in Tencent, data is very siloed between business lines. And then within the government, you may have like the NDRC or the PBOC and then the state security apparatus. They all kind of have different pieces of this data and they aren't sharing it. So in order to really put, um, make, implement this stuff, they're going to have to come up with a better way to coordinate and centralize who is, is doing what with all of this data. Yeah, totally. Um, to uh, address your point there about Tencent, yeah, there was a there was an essay recently, right, that that dived into that. Actually, there's been a couple of very long uh, deep dive essays in Chinese recently on, on Tencent. But um, the one I'm thinking of was uh, was referring to that point that um, actually the the data between different divisions is siloed, and uh, that's that's a big problem for them. And it kind of leads into in, into their culture about um, you know uh, internal competition where where the teams are. Uh, are kind of like uh, competing against one another. Um, yeah, uh, my understanding is there there is that. Yeah, that is an issue uh, w within the company. Uh, but I, I also know that the, the higher management are very much very much aware of it and, and trying to address it in some ways. Well, so um, so I just want to jump jump in real quick. I mean, because Sam, I mean, I feel like a lot of what what you're kind of talking about also applies to you know the the social credit system that 
um, a lot of people in the West are, 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 or let's say a lot of people outside of China um, are, are kind of wringing their, their hands over. And, you know, based on the assumption that somehow China is building this uh, Orwellian dystopia where, you know, through artificial facial, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, through the social credit system, that uh, your every move is going to be watched. And if you're not behaving correctly, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be punished in a way that's uh, irrevocable or or, or very difficult to um, to uh, to change, and so I mean, what what what's your take on the social credit system? <laughs> it's a bit of a, a long wind up, but what, I mean, what's your take yeah. on the social credit system? Is that I mean, is it it's it, is it siloed as well? Does it have similar problems as you were just describing? Every every week, it seems there's a new article in the West that comes out about this panopticon Orwellian social credit system in China, and everyone is hysterical about it um, here in the yes. U.S. <laughs> so, totally. So, um, and every article is an exact copy of the one that came before, and I'm like, why is some, why is someone publishing another one? Um, there have been a, a couple of, of, of good ones though, and I think the ones that are that that I find more accurate, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well, are the ones that sort of take a more cautious approach because this is the the document the social credit plan as it was envisioned in the 2014 document you know that's that's an aspiration and implementing that is a whole nother story um, I think that the risks of it becoming that scary panopticon are certainly very real and there is you know we're seeing the government use technology as part of building a very comprehensive surveillance system for sure um, but it may not be as as terrifying as I think it's being made out to be yet one and one of this one of the issues is comes back to, to data right um, my understanding is that so far the kind of data that's being used used um, as part of the of the pilots, at least, is more law enforcement data. It's like, did you violate a court order, um, you know, a, a traffic issue? Um, but it's not the kind of data that would be used to kind of perform these algorithmic governance decisions. So like sucking in your social network and your transactions online and then using that to sort of allocate um, other kinds of advantages in society. My impression is that we're not there yet um, and that there are a lot of obstacles and it's very controversial even within China. I think that this growing awareness about privacy rights actually in China could be an important check on some of this. Um, it just it may delegitimize some of that vision as it was spelled out in the 2014 document. I'm curious what you guys are seeing though. Yeah, I mean, I think that I mean, you know, talking with fintech companies, it, it's uh, it's pretty obvious. I mean, so that when we're talking about credit systems, I mean, I think that one of the big problems is that a lot of a lot of observers they conflate two two very different types of systems. Uh, one is the social credit system that we're talking about, which is uh, government uh, data data use, and as you were saying, kind of um, uh, looking at looking at behavior, uh, whereas. Um, and in, in, in particular, when it comes to like enforcing laws uh, and and consequences for 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 following or not following those laws, um, whereas you look at something like um, you know Sesame Credit, I mean that's 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 a risk assessment system basically, uh, and so because China hasn't had uh, central uh, credit agencies like uh, like we have in the, in the in the US you know at any time you're doing any kind of financial product anytime you're doing anything in e-commerce these days you need you need to have your own risk assessment model uh, and so a lot of that is, is going to be credit scores and so for some reason somehow people are getting getting those confused which I think is uh, which is kind of interesting because they're 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 very separate and the purposes are very different. And the, so the financial credit is really about solving a real problem. You know, if you don't have an ability to assess credit, that's a main, that's an obstacle in the fintech space and in China's, you know, broader digital economy, right? And and the financial space. So that's sort of solving a real problem, um, which is separate from some of the panopticon stories that we hear. Um, I 
I, ha- I heard a good quote um, from a, 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 co- a colleague of mine who's an executive in one of China's big internet companies, and he said there's a Confucius quote about, you know, what does a government need to govern? And there's food and army and and xin and, and credit or trust. And he said that one of, you know, he thinks that, that, that credit or trust or sincerity, however you translate that, is fundamental in governance. So I think that there's a real need for that um, in in, in society that may also have some benefits that people don't talk about as much. Yeah, and also I was um, I was in I was talking to a to a Chinese histor- his, uh, history professor um, in Hong Kong. Um, he's he's written he's a very prolific uh, writer. Uh, goes his his name is uh, Frank Decoder. Um, I think he's I think he's Dutch, but uh, but he's based in Hong Kong and. Um, and I ended up reading one of his books, and so I talked. I, I was kind of uh, picking his brain about some things, and and one of the things that he mentioned to me as I was kind of like laying out laying out this thesis about kind of where 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 China is going with its technology, he was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, that what you're saying makes sense, but on the on the other hand, if you look if you look at the history of Chinese of China's history of big, ambitious projects, they never quite get it right. And I think Paul Moser uh, on Twitter, he coined the term uh, Chabu Dwellian. And I think that, that that's that, that's kind of a term that I think needs to be more used when we're looking at um, when we're looking at things, things like the credit system or, or, or other larger, very ambitious projects is that, you know, um, and I think, you know, uh, Seneca had a great, had a great, uh, series of podcasts with, uh, with Chaz Freeman Jr. And I think that one of the things that he mentioned was that China is, uh, really great at strategy. They're really great at formulating big picture, big plans, but they're not so good when it comes to actual implementation. Uh, and I think certainly in my experience in the business world, I can say that this is this is pretty true. And also my observation of of the Chinese government and and kind of their 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 historical lack of of effective enforcement mechanisms says that's true as well. And so what it really comes down to is, yes, of course, you can have this system. But at the end of the day, does the person making the decision actually know what know how they're supposed to behave, know what the actual decision they're supposed to be making is? And do they decide to actually follow through on that? I completely agree. I think that when we look at the state level plans that come out in China, it's always important to remember that these are aspirational documents and behind those documents are always fault lines and internal tensions that will impact what actually happens from some of this stuff. So one of the the internal fault lines that we've talked about earlier is this debate between um, AI and development of AI and privacy. This debate is playing out right now. You know, what is the meaning of data ownership in the age of AI? This is unresolved. And I think in, until there's more clarity on that, again, it's not so, we don't know how plans like the social credit system or even China's new rules around data privacy are really going to play out. And different actors in this system will have different interpretations of those fault lines. And that's going to determine, you know, how they implement it. So, um, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he's, uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a really great historian, uh, has ri- written some really interesting books about the, the future of, of, uh, of humanity and, and technology. And one of the things that he talks a lot about is uh, the useless class. And so this is kind of an idea that's been kicking around in my head for, for, for quite some time, in particular how it uh, applies to China. And Sam, I don't know if this is a question that's, that's kind of up your alley, but we're kind of talking a little bit about it. And so I thought I'd, I'd ask. I mean, so you look at you know, you look at China's um, definite emphasis on creating competitive artificial intelligence, and so they they want to be globally competitive in in this space. And of course, like we're not really there yet in terms of artificial intelligence replacing jobs. I mean, certainly you look. I mean, a- autonomous driving um, and and some very very basic things. These you know, five years from now, let's say it could it could replace a certain number a certain number of jobs. But in China, I mean, you look at the number of people that. That are, uh, you know, their their livelihood is based on you know being a DD driver or being a Meituan driver or or whatever. That autonomous driving could, you know, you know, take them out of a job completely. And so I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, do you how do you see this actually playing out? Um, you know, artificial intelligence, the useless class, and and things like that in China. Um, 
I think that there's an argument to be made that AI is also solving some interesting labor and demographics challenges in China right now. Um, and I've heard from um, from Jenny Lee at GGB Capital, for example, that one of the top AI startups was used to um, pick out different kinds of mushrooms on an assembly line because this is a job that has really high margins, but there just weren't workers that were willing to do that kind of job. And so they were using things like computer vision and robotics to sort out these very high-end, expensive mushrooms. You know, another example that she gave me that I thought was great was um, maintenance on wind farms. This is a really dangerous kind of job. Um, it's important for sustainability. And so using AI applications and sort of going up in, in these very remote, windy, dangerous areas and maintaining the equipment. So there's also an argument to be made that applications of AI in China are going to be used um, to solve gaps um, as labor and demographics shift as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because because one of the one of the big things is like if there is if there is a useless class, then you know what where where is where does communism fit? Um, and I sorry, I mean and this is kind of irrelevant at this point, but um, but I just started reading uh, Harari's new book, 21, 21 Problems for the Twenty First Century, and he's basically talking about the irrelevance of of the the coming irrelevance of the working class, and it's a really interesting problem for the Communist Party because you know you can't really have communism without workers. Yeah. And what happens to, you know, the people that ride in the elevator up and down with you and push the button? Mm. Like, what do they have? Is there a new is there a new niche that they find around AI or not? Well, I think that's a dilemma to be looked at, too. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Sam, thank you very much for, you know, this uh, very stimulating discussion today uh, and for your time. If our listeners want to find you online, uh, where can they where can they do so? Um, they should go to my bio page at CSIS and my publications and media and information is all up there. Perfect. And we'll, we'll include those in, in the show notes. Thanks again, Sam. Great. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the conversation. And that's about all the time we have for this edition of China Tech Talk. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you left a review on iTunes. Or if you're on Pocket Cast or Overcast, you can tap on that star button and it will recommend this episode to your network. So without further ado. You got to say, you got to say, and without, we give you Sam Sachs or something. Yeah, like. <laughs> okay. All right.